The predictions about the catastrophe that is the coronavirus get more ominous by the day. The World Health Organization says it poses a greater global threat than terrorism. That's bad enough. But what the expert you're about to meet says is even more terrifying. Professor Gabriel Leung believes 60% of the world's population could become infected with the virus and that as many as 45 million of us might be killed by it. Now, it would be easy to dismiss the professor as alarmist, except he's the man who led the fight against the SARS virus. He knows what he's talking about. We ignore him at our peril. It's not a matter of if, but when Australia's streets will look like this. It doesn't appear that any country has been completely successful at 100% containment and driving it back into the wild. This is life for the 7 million people of Hong Kong, caught in the crosshairs of the coronavirus. It frightens me. But I think that a little bit of anxiety will give you that extra bit of motivation to take precautions. A world where people only venture out in masks, where almost all public places are deserted for fear of infection, where businesses are deserted and economic markets are in panic. And this may only be the start. There is now an emergency going on, and what we must do is very rigorous infection control. This is the new normal of possibly the greatest pandemic the world has ever seen. If coronavirus is the disease X the world has been fearing, then it possibly began somewhere like this, among a colony of bats. There's sleeping time bombs across the region right now. And then somehow the virus almost certainly crossed over to humans at so-called wet markets. These are places all over Asia, but particularly China, where wild animals are slaughtered on site and sold for food. I think this is Mother Nature's revenge. Stephen Galster is an environmental and human rights investigator who's been campaigning for years against Asia's wet markets. Governments throughout the region claim they've shut them down because of the coronavirus pandemic. But here in Bangkok, as you'll see, we're about to go undercover to show that's simply untrue. Stephen is fighting the coronavirus at its very source. To contain, to delay, to research, and then to mitigate. While this man is leading the scientific fight against the pandemic at emergency World Health Organization meetings all around the world. One and a half percent uh, of that 100-person cluster uh, has asymptomatic shedding of a live virus. So Professor Gabriel Leung is considered the world's foremost expert on coronavirus. Based in Hong Kong, he led the global fight against SARS. At first, we heard rumours uh, about a new, mysterious, atypical pneumonia. Um, sort of brewing on the mainland. Was there much fright in those days? Was there? Of course, of course. Um, th it was very scary. No end in sight to the SARS crisis. The SARS death toll continues to rise. In November 2002, SARS rampaged through 17 countries, infecting over 8,000 people and killing nearly 800. Experts say that's just a hint of what this latest coronavirus could do. 
it is certainly more effective. So, um, and, and it's also very difficult to try to control it. And coronavirus, or COVID-19, as the illness is now being called, spreads far more rapidly than SARS. Unchecked, as countries like China and South Korea have discovered, the infection rate becomes exponential. The big unknown now is really how big is the iceberg. So you're guessing there could be many, many more people. I who... don't know, but I'm suspecting that. Coronavirus has already struck over 80 countries and counting. Professor Leung's prediction for the eventual extent of the pandemic is chilling. From everything you've learned over the past uh, weeks and months, what is your best estimate of how many people around the world could be affected by this virus? Don't know. Everybody is susceptible. And if you assume that everybody randomly mix with each other, then eventually you will see um, 40, 50, 60 percent of the population get infected. At current mortality rates, that level of infection would mean between 45 and 60 million deaths worldwide. And that's just in the first wave of the virus, despite the desperate draconian lockdown measures being used in China. Is the second wave worse than the first wave, do you think? Don't know, but we have to prepare for that possibility that there is a second wave. As a person and a scientist, does this virus frighten you? Every time I'm, I'm involved in an epidemic, it frightens me. As Australia now prepares to be hit by the first wave of coronavirus, it's worth looking at the effect it has had on infected cities like Hong Kong, so close to the epicentre of the outbreak. I can tell you in all the years I've been coming here, this is not normal. This is one of Hong Kong's busiest market streets. And at this time of the day, it is always packed, jammed, teeming, shoulder to shoulder with tourists and shoppers. But this is a product of what public health officials call social distancing. If you don't have to be on the street, if you don't have a good reason, most of these people are going to the subway on either end, then simply stay home. All over Hong Kong, the impacts of this city battling its deadly unseen enemy are everywhere. Shopping malls deserted. Amusement parks shut down or attended by the very few. Mandatory temperature checks before entering restaurants. You do this to all the customers, do you? Yeah. Okay, your temperature is 34.7 degrees. And once inside, perspex screens to shield the patrons. On the streets, the elderly line up for free handouts of masks and hand sanitizer. Most shops are selling little else. And where people are forced to congregate, like the subway system, everyone wears a mask. The people of Hong Kong have accepted the new world of the coronavirus. Don't have much choice, really. But this is the reality if you're in close proximity. Has been for weeks now since the outbreak began across the border in China. The question is, are Australians ready and willing to take the extreme measures necessary to avoid infection? With so many people here on the streets wearing masks, can you see the same sort of culture being played out on the streets of Australia? Hong Kongers have lived through SARS, and one of the first things they did was go out and buy masks. There's been a month-long shortage uh, of them ever since. Tom Grundy is editor of Hong Kong Free Press and a long-time resident 
who doubts whether populations in Australia and other Western countries will respond to coronavirus in the unified way people here have. Of course, yeah, people are very disciplined about um, keeping this virus under control. Goodness knows how, you know, other perhaps less disciplined places who haven't lived through something like this are, are going to cope. But according to Tom, there's a much darker dimension to the coronavirus outbreak. He says there's deep suspicion here that a major reason it became a pandemic is a massive state cover-up ordered by China's President Xi Jinping, including arresting the whistleblowing doctor who later died. This is the Xi Jinping virus, uh, not the cause of it, but certainly the breadth of the outbreak is because of the authoritarianism and the lack of press freedom in the mainland. There was no mechanism for anyone to raise the alarm about this. The one doctor, you know, who tried to in the early days and ultimately succumbed to the disease was, was detained and told to shut up. Public health crises and closed secretive governments don't really go together, do they? Right. They've even admitted that, you know, they've, they've changed the way they, they collect data um, a couple of times. So. It's very, very tough. Do you think the death toll numbers that they're reporting are accurate? There is a lot of pressure in China for things to get back to normal. The economy is suffering. Um, so I think, you know, it would be reasonable to, to think that there, there is some malarkey with, with the figures. Um, but, you know, it, it's a black box. We are in uncharted territory. One measure of China's influence is the pressure it has put on the World Health Organization to not officially call the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic. But on that front, the man at the center of it is blunt. Why is there a blockage with that? Why was the WHO reluctant to call it a pandemic? Well, technically it is. I suspect that it may be because colleagues may think that if they will use the word pandemic, then uh, it would trigger um, panic. And panic is no good for any kind of outbreak control. How was this virus born? What was the mechanism that gave birth to it? Probably a zoonotic jump. That is from a small mammal, likely uh, reared uh, or captured at least for food consumption. The reservoir appears to be uh, a bat. Coming up, undercover. Penguins have been high on the menu for a while. In an illegal wildlife market. Highest risk during the handling process. Is this where the coronavirus... Jumped from an animal to a person. ...was born? That's the lesson here. That's next on 60 Minutes. So that will work well. As you turn your head, you'll be able to film Steve and I. I'm with Stephen Galster, an environmental and human rights investigator based in Thailand. But this, we've got the, the lenses in the backpack, right? We're getting ready for an undercover operation using secret cameras. So this should work quite well for us. This just all tucks away in here. Our target, an illegal wildlife market in Bangkok. <coughs> Places like this and so-called wet markets where wild animals are sold for food, are where coronavirus first jumped from animals to humans. So in viral terms, these things are really living petri dishes, aren't they? Yeah, there's sleeping time bombs across the region right now. Stopping the zoonotic jump at source is of course critical. In Hong Kong, Professor Gabriel Leung is at the center of the scientific fight against coronavirus. We are progressively building a fight that began at a wildlife market in Wuhan, China. Does the virus transmit into humans through people eating these animals or just handling them? Probably the highest risk during the handling process, where you have animals under stress, therefore their immune system is down, and then through the handling process, including slaughter, that's when the highest risk of jumping from animal to humans would have occurred. Experts aren't certain, but the suspicion is that in Wuhan, coronavirus crossed to humans from the most trafficked wild animal in the world, the pangolin. 
Pangolins have been high on the menu for a while. Whatever it was, it was an animal. It jumped from an animal to a person. It's a wild animal that's been taken out of its natural environment, consumed in some way, come into contact with people in an unnatural way. That's the lesson here. Do you find it mystifying that you can have a, a grandparent dying in an aged care home in Sydney from an animal that was sold in a market in China? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, I have to say we're not surprised because we've been working on this for years. We've been trying to warn people that, you know, this is global. We're walking into the heart of Bangkok's go. immense Chattachuk market to see how seriously Thailand's authorities are taking the threat that coronavirus has so dramatically exposed. Here in hot, squalid and cramped conditions, wild animals smuggled in from all over the world. I think of this place as a tortured chamber and a filthy laboratory all mixed into one. From AIDS to SARS, and now the pandemic affecting over 80 countries worldwide. Most new diseases infecting mankind are caused by a virus that began in a wild animal and leapt to humans in settings just like this. They've all been pulled from their natural environment, brought thousands of miles in some cases all the way here in contaminated conditions, bringing with them God knows what, with literally thousands of people here today. It's the perfect storm really for the Wuhan thing to happen again right here. As part of its desperate efforts to contain coronavirus, China closed over 20,000 wet markets. But wildlife markets like this are still operating with impunity across Asia, run by organized crime syndicates. These syndicates, we know who they are. We've been following them for years, and they're still out there, and they're not gonna close down business today because China you know, closed down Wuhan. These are like drug dealers, you know? You make it difficult to sell drugs in one neighborhood, they're gonna move to another. Huddled in their cages and glass boxes are everything from Australian cockatoos, even blue-tongued lizards, to African meerkats, European ferrets, rare tortoises and snakes. These animals are never together in the wild and so are vulnerable to viruses carried by each other. In these terrible conditions, those viruses can pass to the humans who handle them. The next global pandemic could easily begin in one of these cages. So what are they selling that iguana for? Is that for meat? I have So you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, that'll cost about 150 US dollars. Then, deep within the market, a single shop that should rightly terrify a world reeling from coronavirus. An African serval cat, a fennec fox from the Sahara, and marmosets from South America. This is just incredible. You know, African cats, snakes, you've got monkeys, primates, in the same confined space. Has no one told these people that, that this is where the other viruses came from? Well, we have, and we've told them this is Wuhan in the making, number two, and so we're asking them to shut it down because it's a prescription for disaster. All within this small, hot room, ready to infect somebody. That, that is amazing. I've seen it all now. Yeah. So if you want to stop the next pandemic, it's going to have to be truly a global attempt to shut these markets down. Yeah, I mean, look, coronavirus is spreading all over the world. So that should tell us we need to not just shut down the markets in China. We need to shut them down in Thailand, Indonesia, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, and perhaps other countries as well. Mm. Otherwise, it's going to expand or recur. If our response to the coronavirus catastrophe is global, and it has to be, then surely our response to the deadly threat posed at the very source of these viruses must be equally global.
because trade is global, goes everywhere, and a bad a virus that jumps from one animal could go you know, back to my country or any other country. And I hate to say it, but I think the penguin, in this case, the most heavily trafficked mammal in the world, whose only defense is to curl up into a ball, has decided that conservationists weren't doing enough, it struck back itself. I think this is Mother Nature's revenge. Coming up, give it all you got. Throw everything at it. Are you ready? We are facing a health challenge. For the fight of your life. For every death, expect to see 80 to 100 cases. What Australians must do. Designed our ICU with a pandemic mode. To beat the coronavirus. If you're extremely lucky, you might even be able to contain it. That's next on 60 Minutes. You have the symptoms of coronavirus. Friends, family or workmates may have already been infected. Whether you live or die depends on two things. How Australia's health authorities and hospitals cope with this pandemic, but mainly how old you are. We would be particularly worried for frail elderly patients who became unwell with respiratory failure with this infection. Associate Professor Chris McIsaac is Director of Intensive Care at Royal Melbourne Hospital. As coronavirus gathers force in Australia, he and his staff are on the highest alert level in modern history. We have a 42 bed ICU. I think if we needed to provide intensive care for more than that number, uh, it wouldn't be business as usual. What do we know about the type of people who are being killed by this virus? Age, overriding, overriding determinant, age. Elderly? Yes. In Hong Kong, Professor Gabriel Leung is one of the global scientific leaders in the fight against coronavirus. He says if infected with the virus, people over 65 are 20 times more likely to die from it than those under 65. Let's pray that we will not see a nursing home or retirement home facility um, having the same experience because the outcomes could be absolutely, absolutely dire. Tragic news this morning, a 95-year-old woman who was living at the aged care facility here, losing her life to coronavirus. This In Australia, the cases are coming. And as Professor Leung has already witnessed in other countries, the fear is what starts with a few cases quickly become hundreds. And then local epidemics soar into uncharted territory. Now is the time to really pull out all the stops, put everything you got into it to fight it. We have to give it the whole of government approach, give it all you got throw everything at it, quick and early and hard. That will buy you sufficient time. And if you're extremely lucky, you might even be able to contain it. If you're extremely lucky. If you're extremely lucky. We're actually fortunate to have designed our ICU with a pandemic mode. We've never needed to activate that mode, but that's regularly tested and ready to go in case we do get an influx of patients. So I'm just going to the pandemic yeah. mode. Like in hospitals all across Australia, Chris McIsaac and his senior intensive care staff at Royal Melbourne are preparing their emergency pandemic response for when coronavirus hits hard. So when we push that, the whole pod's A and B go negative. There's a proper anteroom, all the doors are automatically closed. Absolutely. And there's actually an airlock. Definitely. To enter yep. in three spots. Yep, and that's ready to okay. go. Good. We don't know where the cases are going to emerge in particular, and so it's important that all hospitals have their pandemic plans activated. Professor Kirsty Busing is director for the Victorian Infectious Diseases Service. 
They've mm -hmm. got someone down there. They've just arrived from Iran mm -hmm. um, and they've got off a plane yesterday. Yeah. Now they're, they're febrile and they're hypoxic. So this will require community response. Uh, everybody needs to understand that, that we, we are facing a health challenge, but it's a health challenge that, that together I think we can um, overcome and help to limit the impact. But with Australia's death toll from coronavirus standing at three and around 80 confirmed cases, Professor Liang warns there must be dozens, possibly hundreds more cases out there that haven't yet been detected. For every death, you would expect to see 80 to 100 cases. So if you start seeing deaths before you start picking up large numbers of cases, the only conclusion that one can reasonably and scientifically draw is that you hadn't been testing nearly early enough or extensively enough. Unless you go and test, you're not going to find. We're looking at scenarios from the most benign through to, you know, some millions of people being infected over a, a, a period of several weeks. With the worst case scenario of millions being infected in Australia, the risk is that our health system will become dangerously overloaded. But at least, according to Professor Liang, we're better placed to come through this pandemic than many other countries around the world. If you've got millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who might actually be infected, I fear that this is going to bring about another massive instance of health inequity. Because this disease actually is only treatable if you've got ICU beds, if you've got ventilators, if you've got good drugs availability to tie the people over when they get really sick. In other words, you're saying the people who will survive are only those who can afford it. In health systems that can afford it. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.